Good morrow, one and all, I'm Mr King, and in today's video, we are looking at the poem, We Lived Happily During the War. So what do you need to know to understand this poem? Well, the poet, Ilya Kaminsky, was born in Odessa, which is in Ukraine, but his family fled to America when he was 16 to escape anti-Semitic persecution. And as a young man living in America, close to the US-Mexican border, he witnessed lots of atrocity and brutality in different ways. So for example, in some of his writing around this poem, he's commented upon seeing um, people taken away who are suspected of crossing the border. And he also refers to police brutality against people of color, which has been a very prominent issue in the news in recent years. Now, this poem, talks about a war in America and it's not referring to a specific war or a specific conflict. It could even be a made up conflict. Um, but he does talk a lot in recent years about parallels between what he is seeing in terms of America's response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and what he explores in this poem. In fact, his poem went viral when Russia invaded Ukraine and we'll talk about why that was in a minute. Now, Kaminsky, in his writing, often draws comparisons between how people experience life and happiness in the face of conflict while remaining silent. So he's talking about people seeing police brutality in America and doing nothing. He's talking about seeing conflict around the world and people getting on with their daily lives, not doing very much about it. And his work and this poem in particular criticises that unwillingness to act in the face of violence and conflict. So let's have a look at the poem now and we'll check that we understand everything that is going on in it. We lived happily during the war. And when they bombed other people's houses, we protested, but not enough. We opposed them, but not enough. I was in my bed. Around my bed, America was falling. Invisible house, by invisible house, by invisible house. I took a chair outside and watched the sun. In the sixth month of a disastrous rain, in the house of money, in the street of money, in the city of money, in the country of money, our great country of money, we, forgive us, lived happily during the war. Now, when Russia invaded Ukraine a few years ago, this poem by Ilya Kaminsky sort of went viral. It was being read really widely because people were seeing parallels between the ideas he explores in this poem and what people were seeing in how countries and governments and people responded to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And Kaminsky was interviewed by CNN, the American news organization, about his poem and its relevance. And honestly, if you are a student studying this poem, you should take two minutes to read that article in full because it is amazing. And I will put a link to it in the description below. But what I am going to do is I'm going to pick out some of the key things he says in that article because I think it's a really helpful introduction to his poem. So here we go. Now, Kaminsky says that his book of poems chronicles life in war, highlighting both moments of beauty and terror and condemns silence in the face of injustice. So he's really critical of people and countries who see conflict, who hear about violence and yet are silent and how, who do nothing about it. And the poem is heavy with irony about the greatness of our capitalist nation, he is specifically talking about America, but actually it could apply to any big capitalist country like the UK, for example. So it's heavily critical of capitalist nations which are happy only because their backs are turned um, away from violence and conflict. He calls it ignorant bliss to put your head in the sand and ignore moments of conflict and violence. And this poem, We Lived Happily During the War, is meant to be a wake up call. We should pay attention when we see violence and injustice. So I'm just going to read out this little passage from the article because I think it's brilliant. The hope of the poem, the poet writes, is to help the reader see their own complicity of being silent in the face of violence. So complicity is all about 
feeling responsible. So the poet wants us, when we read the poem, to feel a sense of responsibility whenever we are silent in the face of violence. The poem doesn't want to be a pronouncement. The poem is a warning. This is what happens when half measures take place. We lived happily during the war, the poem begins, and it ends with the same words. But by the time it gets to the final line, one hopes the reader might find the horrific irony in the fact of repetition. How many wars can we live through happily? One hopes the reader sees the critique of this we and what it has done. By the time you get to the repetition of our country of money and then to our great country of money, one questions the word great. This is what art hopes to do. It doesn't shout at the reader saying you must change. Instead, the reader is changed by the act of reading. I recommend you maybe just take a moment to pause this video and have a reread of that. But this is showing that Kaminsky wants to challenge us and convict us. When do we stay silent when we see injustice all around us? There's a part in the poem, one of the interviewers says, the line, forgive us, where speakers seem to be asking to be absolved of their guilt for the not enough protesting and the opposing they did for living happily during the war. Do you think that this is something that can be forgiven? What should be expected of those living outside of Ukraine or any country experiencing unrest in times like these? That's a question that Kaminsky was asked and the response he gives is this. As an author, I see the irony in the citizens of the American empire sowing so much concern for the victims of, for example, the Russian empire, while America is regularly bombing other people's houses around the world, and all the while it uses police brutality against its own citizens right at this very moment. And he gives an example um, of the American empire um, showing concern for Ukraine, but you know, ignoring other conflicts around the world. And he gives the example of Chechnya. So Chechnya um, in 1999-2000 was when uh, Vladimir Putin in Russia used ballistic missiles to bomb um, the capital Grozny to the ground. And according to Kaminsky, um, the Western world was outraged for a few minutes and then it was forgotten about. And why was it forgotten about? Because, he says, oil and gas companies make so much money from dealing with Russia. And so here he says, that this is the problem. The problem is money. People care more about money than about dealing with systemic injustice. I wonder if you can think of examples where you feel people care more about money than they care about solving problems. For me, it makes me think about the climate crisis. Do sometimes we seem more interested in supporting fossil fuel companies and big industry than dealing with the systemic injustice that's destroying our climate? So, in summary, this poem is criticising those who are silent in the face of injustice. Now, let's actually dive in to analysing the poem at this moment in time by looking at the title. Now, I was teaching this poem to my year 10 students last week, and one of them asked me, can we analyse the title? And the answer is, yes, you can. And also, yes, you should, because you can get a lot out of the title. So what can we say about the title? Well, firstly, it's a really shocking thing to imagine living happily in a war. You know, normally, one might expect misery and suffering in war. So to describe living happily, it implies something isn't quite right. It's quite shocking. And this straight away draws attention to one of the poet's key themes, that being happy or complacent in a time of war is problematic. Now, this shocking tone is created through the contrast of the adjective happily and the noun war. They're almost opposites in many people's minds. And this contrast is designed to shock you into realising that something is very wrong in this poem. And what is wrong, of course, is the fact that people in this poem can be happy or complacent in the face of war. Now, a really clever thing that you can comment on if you want to get top marks in your exams is thinking about why a writer might start or end with a certain idea. So here you could comment on the fact that Kaminsky chooses to start his poem with this provocative and shocking statement. 
And by doing so, he, he automatically puts readers on edge. It makes readers feel uncomfortable. And this will help him as he tries to make readers feel on edge and uncomfortable when thinking about the idea that some people are perfectly happy to do nothing to stop a war or injustice. Now, Kaminsky continues in a very matter of fact tone to describe the violence inflicted upon other people's houses. This violent imagery of destroyed houses reminds readers of the cost of war. And for many readers, this imagery could create sympathy for the victims of war. Yet what is odd about this imagery is the fact that it's said in a very matter of fact tone. The way that he starts line one with the connective and makes the narrator seem very casual about the violence, like he's commenting on it as if it's an afterthought. This casual or matter of fact tone implies that this narrator, who lived happily during the war, has almost lost the ability to care or feel emotion about the cost of war. I would use the word desensitised here, which just means the narrator has lost the ability to, to care or feel concern about the cost of war. The narrator is desensitised to the violence of war. He no longer cares about it. Now, this desensitised attitude is exaggerated through two types of contrast. The first type is the contrast between the title, living happily during the war, and the imagery of other people's houses being bombed. I mean, just with the title on its own, it was shocking to imagine someone living happily during a war. But that shock is exaggerated through the contrast of living happily, while simultaneously there's imagery of houses being bombed. This is meant to shock us into thinking about how awful the narrator's apathy is. But there's also a second type of noteworthy contrast here. There's a contrast between other people and we. This creates an us versus them mentality. One reason why the narrator doesn't seem to care about war is because it's happening to other people. It didn't happen to the narrator directly. We to use the word the narrator gives us, we were not affected, other people were. By mentally putting the victims of war into the group of other people, the narrator can mentally dismiss some of their pain. And, you know, the, the cruel irony is that other people, they are still people. The narrator could have said when they bombed our houses, he could have said our neighbours' houses or our friends' houses, but he doesn't. This mental trick enables the narrator to care less about the victims of war, which is just a shocking thing to do. We're not meant to condone or agree with the narrator here. We're meant to condemn this thoughtless way that the narrator thinks about or ignores the casualties of war. And now we come to enjambment. And this is a technique which you will see just is everywhere in this poem. So enjambment is when you have a sentence, um, but instead of the sentence ending at the end of a line, you have a line break unexpectedly in the middle of a sentence. So when a sentence continues onto another line without any punctuation interrupting it. And because this technique is used so prominently in this poem, I'm going to take a 60 second detour to talk about enjambment and its general effects. So to do this, let me ask you, what is the difference between these two images I'm going to show you on the next slide? On the left hand side, we've got the poem as it appears in the OCR anthology. On the right hand side, we've got exactly the same text just put into a typical paragraph. It's not formatted in the same way that the one on the left is. Now I ask you, on the right hand side one, does anything stand out to you? For me, the title stands out because it's in bold. And maybe the word house stands out because you've got this unusual bit of punctuation which kind of draws our attention to the word house. Maybe forgive us also stands out because of the punctuation. But apart from the title, the word house and the word forgive us, nothing really stands out at me just based on how it's laid out on the page. But on the left hand one, lots of things jump out at me, 
which didn't jump out at me in the right hand one. For example, the word protested stands out here. It's a word on its own. Um, America was falling jumps out at me because of um, how it's laid out on the page. Um, even just as ending, we lived happily during the war. Again, it stands out just because of how it's laid out on the page. So in genrement, this technique of having a sentence continue onto the next line without any interrupting punctuation, what it does is it draws our attention to certain words or phrases. And for people who are interested in poetry or who are trying to figure out what a poet is doing, whenever you see in genre like this, whenever we see these line breaks and we see our attention drawn to words or phrases, the question we have to ask ourselves is, why has the poet drawn attention to this word or idea? What is the significance of drawing our attention to this word or idea? That's what we're going to think about in the rest of this video. So let's look at the first example of enjambment in this poem, and we can see it here. And when they bombed other people's houses, we protested, but not enough. Now, I would argue that the enjambment draws our attention to the word protested and the phrase, but not enough. And if you don't believe me, just contrast this here with the same information at the top of the screen where there's no enjambment. For me, the word protested does not stand out as much in this sentence compared to this example here, where the line breaks makes it stand out. And the same is true for the phrase, but not enough. So what can we say about the enjambment used down here? Well, firstly, the enjambment makes the verb protested stand out. It looks isolated and insignificant on the page, almost as if it's saying that the protest that the narrator did was insignificant and isolated. And as we see in the next line, it was also not enough. And the fact that the protest was not enough is made to stand out even more by enjambment. Our attention is drawn to the fact that the protest was insignificant. Now, at this point, I need to pause because I'm sure that some of you are going, hang on, I'm confused. I thought that this was a poem about people who did nothing during a war. Well, isn't that kind of contradicted by the fact that the narrator protested? I mean, after all, that's not nothing. Well, firstly, um, as the poet himself says, the protest here was not enough. But secondly, I don't think Kaminsky is talking about serious, long-term, determined protest, which desires to actually bring about change. I think Kaminsky is referring to the type of protest where someone might hear about a conflict, maybe on the news, maybe express brief frustration, maybe a quick post on social media, but then the issue is very quickly forgotten about. And we see this later in the poem. We see that the narrator's protests weren't very serious because when America was falling, where was he? He was in his bed. He wasn't on the streets protesting. And when houses are being bombed, he's not out there helping people. He's sat in the deck chair watching the sun set. And Kaminsky refers to this article, this idea in the article I mentioned at the start of the video. You know, he is critical of people whose protests are a bit insincere or who don't really do anything in the face of conflict. And that's kind of what we're seeing in this moment here. Now, that previous moment of enjambment is immediately followed up with another one. We have we opposed them, but not enough. Now, for me, the enjambment here, which breaks up this sentence, actually enables us to interpret that little phrase in multiple different ways. You can almost read them out and put the tone of voice and the stress in slightly different phrases. We opposed them, but not. We opposed them, but not enough. We opposed them, but not enough now. So let me just show you what I mean. So one interpretation of this is that we opposed uh, the war, but we didn't really do enough to make a difference. That would definitely reinforce the previous interpretation we were just talking about on the last slide. It could also suggest that we thought we were opposing them, but it turned out we weren't really doing anything but even began to oppose them. Our opposition was so weak and insubstantial. Or we opposed them, but now we've had enough. Had enough of what? Had enough of the conflict or is it just had enough of protesting it was too much effort to protest so the enjambment here can lead us to to write really interestingly about how the narrator's protests were ultimately a bit un insignificant and unsubstantial
And then we come to some really interesting symbolism. And I'm going to talk about two examples of symbolism side by side. First, we have the imagery of a narrator being in their bed when America was falling. And then I want to talk about the symbolism or the imagery of the narrator being in a chair outside and watching the sun while all around them houses were falling, America was falling. Now, I would argue that both of these symbols, both of these images represent laziness or apathy. Apathy is just you know, doing nothing in the face of conflict, not being bothered, or complacency, sort of accepting what's going on and you know, not willing to try and change anything. Because what does being in bed symbolize well when you're in bed you're you're resting you're relaxing you know you're not out there you know engaged with the issues in the world you're you know, you're in your own little world and so being in bed when america was falling symbolizes the narrator being lazy in the face of conflict and again sitting outside in the sun watching the sunset when houses are falling Again, it's a symbol of, of laziness and complacency, which is quite shocking given the context of what's going on around the narrator. Now, we then come to um, this personification of America was falling. And the enjambment also draws our attention to the idea that America was falling. Why was America falling? Well, firstly, it was falling because there was a war. But secondly, it's also falling because good people are doing nothing in the face of conflict and this is a problem and the phrase falling war was falling really stands out because of the enjambment we're forced to really think about why america was falling because of all of this apathy and inaction and then we come to this invisible house or these invisible houses being destroyed and it's being repeated again and again invisible house by invisible house by invisible house what is this even a reference to I think it's a reference to the idea that out of the narrator's sight, people are losing their homes and potentially their lives. So from the narrator's point of view, um, these houses are invisible because the narrator can't see them. But out there, people are losing their homes. And this could symbolise them losing their lives, losing everything. And the fact that this is repeated again and again, it emphasises the scale of the damage. And the end stopping, this, this dash at the end of a line, it forces readers to pause on this imagery of conflict, this imagery of America being destroyed by conflict. And in this context of houses and people's lives being destroyed, it makes the imagery of being in bed and sitting on the chair immediately before and immediately afterwards, it makes it seem all the more shocking. The contrast between the repeated imagery of death and destruction in Invisible House by Invisible House by Invisible House being contrasted with this symbolism of laziness and complacency makes the laziness seem all the worse. How can people stay in bed or sit in chairs watching sunsets when people are losing their homes? The poet seems to be asking us. It just seems awful. It's very condemning of people who would live happily during the war. And then we come to this section about the house of money in the sixth month of a disastrous reign in the house of money, in the street of money, in the city of money, in the country of money, our great country of money. What is this house of money a reference to? Well, my interpretation of this is that the poet is criticising countries like America, but also the UK, you know, capitalist countries, which are so obsessed with money that sometimes they will prioritise financial interests over other issues that are arguably more important. And the repetition and listing of house of money again and again, it makes this idea of prioritising money seem very powerful. It makes it seem like a very entrenched idea. Everyone seems more obsessed with money than standing up against war. And just like the example we saw in the article at the start of the video, how the poet was critical of people who only cared about Chechnya very, very briefly uh, because people cared more about getting money from oil from Russia than condemning Russia. Now, there's a lot of irony in this section here. Firstly, there's irony in the fact that the house of money is still standing in contrast to the invisible houses 
which has been falling. So the contrast between the invisible houses that are falling and the house of money, which is still standing, seems to suggest that America cares more about protecting the house of money, the so banks and financial interests, over looking after people and their lives. It's a really shocking condemnation. Secondly, it's ironic that the house of money is reigning, the disastrous reign in the house of money. So this is a personification. The house of money is reigning even when America is falling. It suggests that people care more about money than even national interests sometimes. That just shows that money is just so important and it means we put our priorities in all the wrong places. This is very similar to the poem Flag, which also suggests that over-prioritising national interests can lead us to blind our consciences. And that's kind of what's being alluded to here. And finally, there's irony in the use of the word great here, our great country of money. Is a country that allows houses to fall, which allows people to lose their lives, which accepts people doing nothing in the face of war, really great? Is it a great country that this can happen? This adjective is used to make readers question, can a country be great if it lives happily during a war? And we then come to this really interesting plea for forgiveness towards the end of the poem. And what's interesting is that it appears in brackets or in parentheses. For me, these parentheses, it makes the apology seem like an afterthought. It makes the apology seem insincere. After all, how sincere or genuine can the narrator be if the narrator was content to sit out and watch houses fall while they're bathing in the sunlight? It seems like a very insignificant apology, an apology, an apology where the narrator isn't really accepting any accountability for their wrongdoing. And that just implies that things will never change if people never really recognise the faults in their behaviour. And that idea is very much reinforced by what we see in the final line of the poem. So the final words of the poem, lived happily during the war, it mirrors the first words of the poem in the title. And so because the poem begins and ends in the same way, you could describe this poem as having a circular structure because it begins and ends in the same way. Why does the poem begin and end in the same way? Why does it have this circular structure? Well, perhaps it implies that the narrator hasn't really learned anything or made any significant changes. After all, like a circle, which has no beginning and no end, perhaps the structure of the poem implies that without significant changes, this cycle of war followed by apathy will continue forever, and it will continue for as long as no meaningful change is made. For me, this poem is a wake-up call, encouraging all of us to campaign for issues we care about and not to bury our head in the sands. You know, we shouldn't just think negative thoughts, but actually use our voice. Let's be um, allies. Let's engage substantially with issues we care about. Go on protests. Write to elected officials. Donate to causes you care about. Be the change you want to see in the world. And we should... Not do as the narrator of the poem does. Uh, we should not simply live happily during the war. We should do the opposite. We should stand up and campaign for justice and for change. So a challenging poem which forces us to reflect on our own attitudes and our own actions when we see injustice. Let me just summarise some final thoughts about this poem. This poem shows how awful it is to do nothing in the face of conflict. That, but even though this poem shows us a narrator who does nothing, 
I don't think we're meant to look at the narrator and go, yes, we should do the same thing. I actually think that the poet is saying, because the narrator's choices are bad choices. So this poem is actually an encouragement to oppose injustice. We shouldn't live happily during the war. We should do the opposite. We should stand up and campaign for justice. Therefore, even though Kaminsky shows us someone who lives happily during the war, you could argue it's actually encouraging us to do the opposite. We should protest where there is injustice in the world. So I hope you found that a useful look at the poem, We Lived Happily During the War. If you'd like more videos like this or more content to support you as you prepare for exams, please do like and subscribe. I wish you the best of luck in any of your future exams. And until next time, cheerio.